Good day, grade tens. Um, welcome to this next lesson on um, statistics and probability in mathematics. As you can recall, we were busy working through statistics and we'd actually done quite a lot. And now we were going to be looking at doing exam type questions. So we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of exam type questions, well a whole bunch, okay not that many. And then we're going to move on to probability and we're going to talk about probability and definitions and terms and everything you need to know about probability in grade 10. Okay, so do you remember that we were talking about grouping data? And the, below it says, the table below shows information about a number of hours 120 learners spent on their cell phones in the last week. So they tell us that there are 120 learners in total. They tell us that this is a survey, the information from a survey of the number of hours that the children spent on their cell phones in the last week. So what we need to do is read this table. Probably one of the most important things is to learn how to read the table, okay? So what we're saying is that 10 learners spent between naught and two hours on their cell phone. 15 learners spent between two and four hours on their cell phone. 30 between four and six, 35 between six and eight hours, 25 people between eight and 10 hours, and only five people admitted to be spending between 10 and 12 hours on their cell phones. Right, so the first question is identify the modal class of the data. Now remember what modal means. Modal, or the mode, is what happens most often. So the easiest thing here, this is one of the easiest questions because we just need to look for the one that's got the highest frequency because that is the one that's going to happen the most often. And if you look over here, you can see, doosh, 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 doosh. do you see that, yeah, this group here has 35 as a frequency, 35 out of the 120 learners um, we use their cell phones for six to eight hours. Okay, there's a 30, a 25, but 35 is definitely the highest. So therefore, this is the modal class. The modal class is for the hours that are smaller than or equal to eight and greater than six. And there's something else I want to point out to you. Do you agree, see, that it does not equal the lower band, because obviously, well, but it does include the upper one. So in other words, you're not having two. It looks like you've got two in both of these groups, but you don't actually have two in both of these groups because this is smaller than or equal to two and this age here is bigger than two. So yeah, we're including two. This is not naught. It's everything about bigger than naught, okay? Then it's one and including two. This, yeah, is bigger than two. So it is everything bigger than two up to and including four okay so this is bigger than four okay so i get i think you get the gist okay so this number yeah this modal class what we identified as the modal class is the h where h is smaller than or equal to eight but bigger than six so that's how you read that okay so that's the modal class i'll write i'll rewrite it over here so you can see it a bit better okay now they say they want to estimate the mean hours that these learners spend on their cell phones in the last week. Okay, so what does mean mean? Mean means average, right? So if we weren't doing group data, we were just doing normal data, what would we do? We would just add up all the different number of hours and we would then add them all up, divide by 120, we get the mean number of hours, right? But now they've grouped it, so they say 10 people use between naught and two hours. 15 people use between two and four hours, okay? So we can't just add up 10 and 15 because that's just gonna get us 120 learners. But what we can do is we can get the mean of every one of these groups, okay? We're gonna get the mean of every single one of these groups. So the average of this group is what's halfway between naught and two is obviously one. What's halfway between two and four is three. What's halfway between four and six? I'm hoping you're going to say five. Halfway between six and eight is seven. 
halfway between 8 and 10 is 9, and halfway between 10 and 12 is 11. So 1 is the mean, it's the average of this group, okay? 3 is the average of this group. 5 is the middle point of this group, 7 is the middle of this, 9 is the middle of this, and 11 is the middle of this. So then, what is this table actually telling us? This table is telling us that approximately, that's why they say estimate, because you're not going to get an exact value. And the reason we're not going to get an exact value is because we've grouped the data. We don't know out of these 10 people how many spent one hour or how many spent two hours or how many spent one and a half hours. Do you understand? But we can say on average, 10 out of 120 learners used their cell phone for one hour. On average, 15 out of the 120 learners used their cell phone for three hours. On average, 30 people, do you get it? So to find the average, to estimate the mean number of hours, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one times by 10, because 10 people on average use their cell phone for one hour, plus 15 times by three, plus 30 times by 5 plus 35 times by 7 plus 25 times by 9 plus 5 times by 11. Okay, so that is all the learners taken into consideration. Because when you add us up, you will get to 120. But now what are we doing? We're finding the mean. So what are we going to do? We're going to divide this all by 120 to get our mean. Right, and now we need to get out our calculators. So let's do that. And there it is. Okay, so let's switch it on. Okay, I'm gonna have to move it somewhere along the line, but that's fine. So we've got 10, I'm not writing one times 10, plus bracket, 15 times three, that's that lot, plus bracket, 30 times five, 30 times five, bracket, plus, bracket, 35 times 7, 35 times 7, close bracket, plus 25 times 9, oops, sorry, 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 let me delete, plus bracket, 25, times nine, close the bracket, plus bracket five times, oh, sorry, five times 11, I don't know why this is playing up today, equals, now that's all of the things, then what we have to do is divide by 120 to get the average, so we're gonna divide by 120, And that gives us an average of 6.08 hours. Okay, because you always round up to two decimal places unless they tell you otherwise. So therefore, it's 6.08 hours. But you know what? It says, estimate the mean number of hours. And do you see it? We can round this off to approximately six hours. So there we go. We can see, oh, I'm so sorry, hours. So therefore, we can see that it's approximately six hours, okay, is the average, which amazingly is also in the modal class. So yay, that works very well. Okay, let's look at the next question. It says, the box and whisker diagram are with values as shown for grade 10 of class of maths test results out of 100. So 100 people wrote the test, it's drawn, okay? There's 10 A, 30, 60, and B. Right, so let's think about what this, inf this information is, okay? Um, first of all, we know that this is the minimum value, okay? This here is Q1, 
This here is Q2, which is also the median, right? This is Q3, which is the upper quartile, and B is the maximum value. And those are your five very serious and very important values for your box and whisker plot, right? Now it says, for the data to determine the median. Okay, well, that's pretty easy. We've just listed everything and all the information. So Q2 is your median, so that is just 30. Next it says, what is the highest test result if the range is 80? Okay, but now the range is always the maximum value minus the minimum value, right? But they've told us the range is what? They've told us the range is 80 equals, we want to work out what the maximum value is. And what is the minimum? The minimum is 10. So if we take that across, we can find out the maximum value is 90. So I can fill that in there, 90, isn't that nice? So that's 90. Now they ask, Q1, if the interquartile range is 44. Okay, so we know that the interquartile range equals Q3 minus Q1. So the interquartile range they've told us is 44. We've got Q3 at 60 minus Q1. So to solve for Q1, what we could do is we could take the numbers all to the other side. So we've got 44 minus 60 is equal to minus Q1. Therefore, Q1 is equal to, it's going to be 16. So therefore, this is 16. There you go, not too bad, hey? So now we've got Q1 and you've got Q3. Okay, and we don't have, and we got Q2. We've got all the numbers of our five number summary. That's awesome. Okay, so that is 16. Next, it says, what percentage of the data lies between the median and Q3? Okay, well, you need to think about that. I mean, if you don't know it off by hand, um, off the top of your head, then you need to think about this. Do you agree that Q2 represents 50% of the data? And then what we do to find, in other words, is the middle, right? Then in order to find Q1, we find the middle between the minimum value and Q2. So this must be 25%. And then Q3, okay, is going, is halfway between the median and the maximum value. So that is 75% of the total data. So therefore, what is the percentage of data that lies between the median and Q3 has to be 25%, it's a quarter of the data. Finally, it says comment on whether you think this class, the class who these results belong to a strong mathematical class or not, justify your comment. Okay, well, do you agree that these are marks out of 100? Okay, these are the test results out of 100. The median is 30, okay, the median. And although there are slightly more results between 30 and 60 than there are between 30 and 16, okay, can you see that most of the data lies between 16 and 30, 60? So I would say no, they are not a strong math class and the reason for this is i would say because the median is only 30 percent which strictly speaking is not a pass okay so okay it's it's, it's no it's not a pass okay so you can see that the average mark the average mark is 30 percent and below Okay, so it is a bit of a problem. Admittedly, there are more people achieving a year between 30 and 60, and you do have an outlier where one person got 90%, but most of the people got 30 and below, or half the people got 30 and below, so therefore we, I would say that they're not a very good 
math class. They're not very strong. Now it says, new question. Again, we've got a table with group data. And it says, for the data given below, and you've got X, which is between 10 and 20, 20 and 30, all the way through to 70. And then we've got this frequency, 2, 5, 8, 6, 3, and 1, right? Again, they want to know the modal interview interval. And remember that for the modal interval, what are we looking for? We're looking for the highest frequency, the highest frequency. So again, we need to go for this because this is 258631. So that's definitely the highest frequency. So therefore, the modal interval is between 30 and including 40. Smaller than and equal to 40 and greater than 30. Right, then it says, what position does the median hold in the data represented? What position does the media hold in the data represented? So now remember the median is halfway. Okay, it's halfway. So now let's count the data. We got if we had to do cumulative frequency, cumulative frequency, do you agree this is two? That's seven. Seven plus eight is fifteen. Fifteen and six is twenty-one. Twenty-one and three is twenty-four. And 24 and 1 is 25. Let me check it. We've got 2 plus 5 is 7. 7 plus 8 is 15. 15 plus 6 is 21. 21 plus 3 is 24. 24 plus 1 is 25. So do you agree 25 divided by 2 is basically 12 and a half? So we're looking at approximately 13. So we're looking for the 13th number. So, yeah, we've got 2 to 7, and yeah, you've got 7 to 15. So, this year, again, what position does the median hold in the data represented? It will be the 13th position, 13th. Hence, state what interval the median falls into. Again, it's going to be from 30 is smaller than x and greater than equal to 40, which means this has got a very good distribution, okay, it's following the proper distribution curve. Now it says estimate the mean. So again, we're going to have to use the rules that we learned in the last question, actually the question before that, where we had to find the average of each of the groups and then multiply by the frequency and then add divide by the sorry divide by the number of learners so in this case we don't even know what they are okay so halfway between 10 and 20 is 15 halfway between 20 and 30 is 25 between 30 and 40 is 30 sorry 35 between 40 and 45 is 45, between 50 and 60 is 55, between 60 and 70 is 65. So now, do you agree that we've they forgot? Hmm, let me find space to write this, let's do done, yeah. The mean approximately is two times 15 plus five times by 25, plus eight times by 35, plus six times by 45, plus three times by 55, plus one times by 65, all over the total, which is 25. So right, so we need a calculator out again. And I just went past it. Okay, so what do we have? We have got, let's do a fraction this time. Bracket, 2 times 15, close bracket, plus open bracket, 5 times 25, close bracket, plus open bracket, 8 times 35, close bracket, plus open bracket, 6 times 45, close bracket, plus open bracket, 3 times, no, let's delete that, 
3 times 55, close bracket, plus, open bracket, 1 times 65, close bracket, equals, oh, sorry, and then divided by, how many people did we say they were all together? 25, and then we can say equals which is 37.4. So the mean is approximately 37,4, which is inside our modal class and where the median interval falls. So this is a beautiful um, example of very good distribution for the simple reason that the modal class with the interval for the median and the estimated for the mean all form in, fall in the same group so that is fantastic with the same interval right so now that we've gone through quite a few examples let's move on to something new well not new to you hopefully but new overall and we're going to talk about probability so first let's go through the definitions and terminology and although it might seem a bit boring you guys do need to know this if you don't know this you won't be able to do probability and that can be a serious problem. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about an experiment. An experiment is not necessarily a science experiment, okay? You don't need for things to go boom, okay? An experiment refers to any uncertain process. In other words, you do something and you're not sure what the result is going to be. For example, if you flip a coin, okay? If, when you flip a coin, you don't know if you're going to get a head or a tail, okay? Or if you throw a dice a couple of times or a number of times. You don't know if it's always going to land in a six or it's going to be six, three, four, whatever the order. So an experiment refers to a certain process, okay? Now, outcomes are basically what you get out as a result of your experiment. So in a single, an outcome is a single result of an experiment. So say I flip a coin and it's tails. That's the outcome of my experiment. Or if I throw a die and it's five, that is an outcome of my experience. Okay. So the sample space is a set of all the possible outcomes. Um, so let's take it just a little bit differently. Let's say I say to you, um, hey, friend, let's go to the movies. And he says, sure, what day? And I say, any day next week. Um, so what is that? That is my sample space. My sample space is all the days that are available next week, which is Monday through Sunday. We then have to have the outcome of the experiment where he decides what day is going to work. Okay, do you understand that? So sample space is a set of all the possible outcomes of an experiment. So example again, if I had to throw a coin, both the head side of the coin and the tail side are sample space. So in other words, my sample space, which is drawn with curly brackets, is heads and tails. My sample space for the die is 1 through to 6, okay, because when I throw the dice, I don't know if I'm going to get a 2 or 3 or a 1 or a 6. Right, now NS is the number of outcomes in the sample space. So even though you might think that there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can answer something, the number of outcomes in, this, in the sample space is, is Sorry, the number of outcomes in the sample space is de designated N. So, for example, again, if I said to you, which day would you like to go to movies? So, there's seven parts of the, there are seven days in the week, right? And every day of the week, the movies are showing. Awesome. So, therefore, do you agree that my sample space is Monday through to Sunday? What is the number of outcomes in my sample space? It's obviously seven because there are seven days. Okay, so again, if we look at the coin, we can see that we assume the coin doesn't fall on its edge like a widow. Let's assume the coin falls either on the one side or the other side, which means that it's heads or tails. Therefore, the sample space is two. Whereas if you've got a die or a dice, okay, your sample space is six because there's six sides it can fall on. 
So coin number set is two, a die sample space number is six. Now an event. Event is a specific outcome. So if I say to you, when you throw the dice, we have to aim for a six. That is a specific event, okay? Or if I get tails when I flip a coin, that is the event, okay? The number of events is the number of elements in the subset, okay? So in other words, again, and please note it's not the same thing as um, the number of outcomes. The number of elements in the subset is the number of the above. For example, a specific outcome, if I get tails when I flip a coin, okay, that's one. Okay, so the number of events is one. That I throw a six when I roll the dice, that is one. Okay. Now, we need to talk about the difference between theoretical probability and re real probability. Okay, and relative frequency. Okay. So, for example, if I say to you, pick up a dice or pick up a coin and throw it, um, what is the probability of you getting um, tails? And you would say, well, there's a 50% probability of it happening. Theoretically, there is a 50% probability of it happening, okay? And theoretically, you, it'll be 50% every time. So in other words, if I flip the coin and I get a tail and I flip a coin again, I have the same probability every time, okay? I've still got 50% chance, right? For a dice, it's got six possibilities okay so therefore it's one in six is the possibility that you will get a six right so the probability theoretical probability says that it is the number of elements in the event divided by the number of elements in the sample space but now relative frequency is an estimate of the actual properties the total number of favorable outcomes over the total number of trials okay and we'll talk more about that and do some examples when we do exam paper questions okay more important are venn diagrams because venn diagrams are a graphical way of representing relationships between sets each set is represented by a circle so now we need to know what the different types of sets are we need to know what the different rules are with regards to these sets okay so both of these the big square block the big square block which contains everything inside is called the universal set okay the only thing that's different between the universal set on the left and the universal set on the right is that on the left you can see that there's no overlapping of the data from set A, set B, and set C, whereas there is some data that is overlapped between set A and set B. The complement of the set is also indicated by B dashed, okay? So in other words, what that means is not B, okay? So in other words, in this case, We've got the universal set, which includes everything, and then we've got not B, which does excludes everything to do with B. Okay, so in other words, this bit here, all of this, including the bits where set A and set C overlap, are not included. Now, the union of a set. So, the union of a set is the bits where they overlap. So in other words, A union B is going to be where they overlap. So it is going to be over yeah. Um, A union C is a bit that overlaps over yeah. And B union C is the bit all the way through that they all overlap okay in other words universal set includes everything underneath everything okay 
this only includes everything found in A and in B. Okay, similarly, everything found in A and in set C. Right, now let's look at the intersection. The intersection is the bit which occur um, in A and B. So in other words, this bit here is the intersection of A and B. I just realized something, I made a mistake. Sorry guys, I made a mistake. A union B is everything in A and everything in B. So A union B is going to be all of this. That's A union B. Because it's everything in B and everything in A. A union B is everything in A and everything in B. Okay. A union B means everything in A plus everything in B. So it has to include all of B and all of A. Right, whereas A intersection B is only the bit that is found in both A and B. Okay, so therefore A intersection, but that I was telling you before is A intersection B. This is going to be B intersection C. Okay. And then finally, this is going to be A intersection C. See, oh, why is it? Why did I do that green? Sorry, guys. Why did I do that green? I meant to do it blue. No, nope, I meant to do it purple. Like this. There we go. So then you can see that the middle bit, right in the middle, right in the middle, this little bit here is A intersection B intersection C. Okay. And that's where they all three intersect. So now we can use Venn diagrams to solve problems. Okay. So let's go through an example. It says in a survey, we've got 70 people. So our universal set has got 70 people. So if I wanted to, we can draw a nice square. Okay, and we've got 70 people in it. They are asked whether they drank tea, coffee, or both. So effectively, we've only got two circles, tea or coffee. Okay, tea, coffee, both. Okay, the reporter stated the following. 25 people drank tea. So under tea, 25 people drank it. 35 people drank coffee, 35 people drank coffee, and 15 people drink neither. So 15 people are out here on the outside because they drink neither. So we're going to go 70 minus 15 gives us 55. So now we've only got 55 people to play with in total. Okay, so do you see we've got 25 people? Oh, that can't be right. Is there overlap? Now it says, how many people drink tea only? How many people drink coffee only? How many people drink both tea and coffee? Okay, now let's have a look at this. This is in the survey, 70 people drink, but uh, the report says that 25 people drink tea, 35 people drink coffee, and 15 people drink neither. Okay, so our sample space has got 70 people. We've already said that. The number of tea drinkers is 25. We've said that. The number of coffee is 35, right? Since 15 people drink neither, that means that 70 minus 15 is, 50, is 55. So 50 people drink at least tea or coffee. Okay, then, oops, sorry. So now that we've got that, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to go further. So now we've got that 55 people at least drink tea or coffee. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this X, okay? We know that all of this plus all of this has to equal X. It has to equal what? It has to equal 55, right? So this bit here, if the whole of this has to be 25, because 25 people drink tea, 
Some of those people might drink coffee. We don't know. So do you agree that this little bit here, okay, the left-hand side is going to be 25 minus x. Similarly, the whole of this minus the x has got to be 35 minus x. So now we've got 25 minus x plus x plus 35 minus x is equal to, what did we say? 55, 55. Oh, sorry guys, I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, so therefore, 25 plus 35 is 60. x minus x cancels, so we've got minus x is equal to 55. Right, so we can take that across and we go 60 minus 55 is equal to x, so therefore x is 5. So now x is 5, that means that there are 5 people that drink tea and coffee, they drink both tea and coffee. 25 minus 5, that means that there are 20 people that drink only tea. And finally, 35 minus x gives you 35 minus x is 30. So 30 people drink both, drink coffee only. So they only drink coffee. They don't drink tea and coffee. So now you can see how Venn diagrams work to help us. Okay, the first thing we did was we identified our total universal set, which was the 70. Right, there's our 70. Then we drew our circles. In this case, we got lucky because we're in grade 10, there are only two circles. And then you've got to be careful because a lot of people will assume that if you said 25 people drink tea, 35 people drink coffee, and 15 drink neither, then a very common error, very common, is to do this and go, well, this year is 25. And this year, not drawn to scale, is 15, I mean, is 35. And 25 and 35 is, what is that? That is 60. And then they said that there were 15 people that didn't drink at all, says so 15. Oh my hat, we're at 75. We've done something wrong, okay? And then they stop because they don't know where to go. But you need to realize that this 25 people drink tea may include some people that drink coffee and similarly the 35 people that drank tea, coffee this may include some people that drank drank tea the only thing we know for sure is that 15 people did not drink either tea or coffee so that's why they go on the outside of here right grade 10s i think let's leave it there we will continue with probability um, in the next lesson, which is on Wednesday. Have a great day.